The thing that truly makes or breaks a Zelda game for me is the characters. Sure, dungeons, weapons, and enemies are important and all, but the cast of individual personalities that make up the cast is what can make a great game for me. It's the difference between having a random generic lady and having a fun, cozy, and welcoming lady such as Henna from Twilight Princess. Henna is a great example of what I mean. She is, at base value in terms of the game, just the person who runs the fishing hole in Upper Zora's River, but the fun and lovable personality of Henna makes her an unforgettable character, who I just enjoy talking to of the game. Because I'm a simp. Characters and their unique personalities are vital to hitting a certain feel and vibe, and personally, I believe that there are a few characters across the series that really hit the mark when it comes to their personality, but sadly, didn't get the spotlight they deserved or could have potentially filled. Today, I've put together a list of five Zelda characters that I personally believe deserved more spotlight for whatever reason in their respective game. Be sure to go grab yourself a snack or a drink and send them in on social media to get featured right here, and let's get into the list. The hero of Hyrule is, without a shadow of a doubt, the most iconic character in the entire series, other than Zelda, but what exactly is his origin story? We know he has a family, and even see some of them across the series, such as his dying uncle in A Link to the Past, or his grandmother and sister in The Wind Waker. But someone we know very little about is his mother. Obviously, each incarnation of Link has a mother, but a parental figure that we never meet. The only time she is canonically mentioned is in Ocarina of Time. We are told by the Great Deku Tree's Sprout, a Hylian mother and her baby boy entered this forbidden forest. The mother was gravely injured. Her only choice was to entrust the child to the Deku Tree, the guardian spirit of the forest. The Deku Tree could sense that this was a child of destiny, whose fate would affect the entire world, so he took him into the forest. After the mother passed away, the baby was raised as a Kokiri. Other than this, she is only mentioned in the A Link to the Past comic from 1992. The mystery behind Link's mother is something I love, but wish I could know more about. I think at the time, leaving her character in the shadows of the past was a good decision, as it allowed us to focus on Link, but in the modern day of Zelda, I think it's time we see the woman behind Hyrule's greatest hero. Perhaps not in the Breath of the Wild sequel, as, well, I think she might be dead now, but in the next game that takes place in a different time frame, I think it would be so, so heartwarming and amazing to have a game where Link is actually living with both his mother and father. A game where it obviously begins with Link waking up, as most Zelda games do, but he wakes up in a home with a mother and father downstairs. Keeping a series as long running as The Legend of Zelda Fresh is vital, and something like giving Link's mother more spotlight would be a huge game changer in my opinion. It would open up so many theories, questions, mysteries, and most importantly, backstory. Perhaps one day we will see the lady behind the hero and saviour of Hyrule, and I bet her cooking is amazing, as all mothers are. Moving on to something that was actually suggested by a lot of you guys on my recent post, asking all of you who you believe deserved more spotlight in the series, an answer I saw a lot was actually the Minish. Not any one Minish in particular, but the race of tiny people in general. I mean, let's face it, combine them all, it makes the size of one person. They resemble mice almost, but they are actually the saviours of Hyrule from long ago. At a time when Hyrule was threatened by great evil and monsters, the Minish appeared from the Minish realm and helped to protect the kingdom. And since then, every 100 years, the people of Hyrule hold the Pikori Festival in celebration of that historic saviour of the kingdom. But little do the people of Hyrule know, the Minish are still within their world. The miniature race of people actually live within the little nooks and crannies of the land, complete villages within tree trunks and long grass, secret homes on the rafters of buildings, and even a small society within a bookshelf. The Minish are living within the world, but are far too minuscule for anyone to see. In that game, Link gains the unique ability to shrink down to their size, and that plays a huge role in the game's story. But the Minish actually had so much potential to return to the series. In fact, it was even originally considered to be a confirmed thing in Breath of the Wild, but for unknown reasons was scrapped. Many fans including myself would have loved their presence in Breath of the Wild, and whilst that never happened, a lot of fans believe there is still a chance for them in the sequel. We know there will be at least a small emphasis on exploring the underworld of Hyrule, and I think it would be really cool if we find the long forgotten Minish tribe down there. Looking at the concept art proposed for them in Breath of the Wild, it appears they were planned to be a little bit bigger than in the Minish Cat, big enough to the point where we could see them without shrinking down, but that's just a guess. 
The Pokori people had and still have so much potential in the series. I mean, for one, they are the ones responsible for all of the hearts and rupees found within the grass across the series. That is something that's confirmed. Either way, seeing how many of you wanted to see the Minish return as a whole really made me happy to know that it isn't just me who's a huge Minish Cap fan. The beginning of the Zelda timeline was a very different time. A time before the Kingdom of Fire was even established and when the people of Hylia lived within the skies. The mysterious land below the clouds known as the surface is what would one day become Hyrule. But during the story of Skyward Sword, the first hero of Hyrule, well, not actually of Hyrule, but the land, got to explore this desolate, unknown wasteland, which, what the fuck is actually beautiful. One of the first contacts Link has down on the lonely surface is with Gorko, a Goron archaeologist who travels the surface to study its history. But they first meet as Gorko has been attacked by a couple of Bokoblins, and Link steps in to help him. Following this event, Gorko and Link meet a few times throughout the game, but not to more than a few conversations. Personally, with this being one of the first ever looks at life on the surface, I thought it would have been really cool to see more of Gorko and Link together, almost exploring the land beside each other, like a couple of lovers. With Link helping Gorko with his research and Gorko returning the favour with guidance around the land. Maybe it's not everyone's pick for an underutilised character, but I definitely felt that Gorko had a ton of potential side quests involving his research which could have created a really fun way to explore the surface, rather than the extremely linear format we were given, as a lot of fans didn't like it. In my all-time favourite video game, Twilight Princess, the cast of characters is stellar. I just love everyone in that game, from the Snowpeak Traveller Ashe to the mysterious old lady Impaz. But similar to the Minish pick, there is actually a group of characters in this game that I believe deserved way more spotlight than given. They go by the name, The Resistance. A group of Hylian vigilantes that operate out of Telma's bar in Castletown, with their main aim being to restore peace to Hyrule better than the Hylian army themselves. A group of people in the shadows standing up and working for what they believe in. The group consists of Telma, Aru, Ashi, Shad, Russell and later Link. Throughout the story of the game, we work with each member individually, such as Ashi guiding Link to the Snowpeak Mansion to recover a mirror shard, working with Shad to research the sky, and even assisting Telma to escort the Zora Prince. But this group in my opinion goes a little under the radar as an actual, well, group. I think this is because we only work with them individually, which is still really cool, but I feel it would have been so awesome to work with the Resistance as a whole, tackle issues across Hyrule together, perhaps some sort of mission to clear out a camp of enemies blocking a pathway, or even something more stealthy in close quarters such as a task within Castletown that requires sneaking past the guards, and staying unnoticed. The concept of the Resistance group is absolutely brilliant if you ask me, and I feel that their full potential was never truly seen, but we all know deep down inside, Twilight Princess is still the best game. Now, before getting into my final pick, I just want to say this. There were a ton of suggestions from you guys regarding characters that deserved more spotlight in their respective games. Whilst this is just my opinion, I do want to highlight some of your guys' suggestions. I saw a lot of Groos and Girahims, which are... Fair enough, I guess. A few tingles, a really interesting pick, the Queen of Hyrule, which I can totally get behind, even a few of my own thoughts such as Link's mother and the Minish and many more, which you can see on screen now. However, my final pick and in my opinion, the Zelda character that I personally believe deserved more screen time, is the self-proclaimed Queen of Bugs, Agatha. She lives within Castletown in her own little palace of a home, a nature sanctuary with a large tree growing through the middle of the building and even reaching the first floor. Agatha sent out invitations to the golden bugs to come to her ball. There are actually 12 golden bug types in the game, with both a female and male variant, so 24 to collect in total. And as a sort of side quest, Link can collect all 24 and bring them back to her to have her bug ball. The girl is obsessed with bugs and has a very unique personality to say the least, with some fans adoring her and others just finding her outright creepy. I for one love her and believe that she deserved so much more spotlight in Twilight Princess. I feel like some sort of side quest to bring her out of her home within the condensed castle town and out with into the wilderness would have been really cool. We can tell from her personality that she is very content with staying put indoors at her house and who can blame her? She has everything she wants at home and damn I feel that sometimes. Well, mostly everything. 
Hell, there are even fan theories that Agatha was part of the royal family, but due to her obsession with bugs and insects was shunned by her own, and given what she truly wanted, but that's a story for another day. For me, Agatha deserved a lot more screen time in Twilight Princess. And honestly, that goes for a lot of the castle town residents. This version of the Heart of Hyrule is the largest lively castle town. I just feel a lot of castle town was passed over rather quickly in Twilight Princess, and that Agatha suffered from that treatment especially. Thanks a ton for watching, I really hope you enjoyed and if you did be sure to drop a like and consider subscribing for more Zelda content. Who are some characters that you think deserved more spotlight in the Zelda series? Leave a comment down below and look out for my replies. A huge heartfelt thank you goes out to all of my wonderful supporters across both Patreon and YouTube. Your support enables me to work here full time and produce these videos as often as possible, so thank you so much. If you'd like to join them here at the end of all of my videos, grab yourself a shout out upon joining and more, then consider supporting on either Patreon or YouTube. Again, thanks for watching, and until the next time, I've been Hyrule Gamer.